Okay, great. I think recording uh, has just started. Um, so what, good afternoon everyone again and welcome to the NHSR Community Conference and welcome to the uh, workshop. One of the first workshops this year is a workshop on fitting distributions. Um, so let me start from introducing our uh, tr trainer or facilitator. So we have today Dr. Sean Mansi, who will be doing all the actual workshop uh, and who is a research fellow in the University of Exeter uh, with quite wide statistic background uh, as well as a direction research background um, as far as I remember. Uh, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so yes, yeah, so hopefully everyone has a link, uh, links to the materials. So you can, for this workshop, you can either use your own RStudio if you have it installed on your laptop and you can uh, follow the uh, materials uh, shown uh, using the GitHub link so you can uh, pull materials and, and go through them or if you're not as familiar with GitHub you can just you know copy code at, uh, as you go or if you have RStudio Cloud uh, you, you should have received link as well. Um, let me just quickly show, share this one with you as well. Um, so that you don't have to install RStudio on your laptop. Um, and the other thing as well I need to flag is that this recording, this workshop is being recorded, so it's record has started. If you have any objections, please flag them in the message uh, chat box. Uh, but also I think at the, end, at the end of the workshop, we might stop recording. If you have like any questions, then jump on. If you don't want to talk and you don't want your voice to be recorded, uh, fair enough, just uh, share your questions via, uh, via, via the chat. Uh, and I think this is everything from me. Uh, so um, without any further ado, I will uh, um, over to you, Sean. Thank you, Anastasia. That's brilliant. Lovely introduction there. And uh, welcome everybody to this uh, conference here on the, uh, the inaugural day of the NHSR Community 2021 conference. And today, yeah, we're going to be fitting distributions in R. So uh, as Anastasia mentioned, there is the uh, link to the GitHub repository with all the workshop materials in it, um, including the full slide deck uh, as well. So in terms of taking notes, um, there's quite a lot of material in, in the slide deck. You know, I tried to make sure that there wasn't too much need to make notes, um, but you might like to make some notes of other things that I'm uh, chatting about kind of around the slides. Um, and I'll just, if I share my screen, okay, sharing going. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, in the GitHub repository, you'll find um, the, uh, the presentation here and the uh, task files for the um, uh, kind of practical tasks that we'll be doing today and also um, an app template um, which uh, I'll talk a little bit towards the end of the presentation today. Uh, if you're using our Studio Cloud, um, just a little reminder that you will just need to uh, start a new project um, and you'll just want to click on there and click new our Studio project. This will load up a uh, our studio instance with all of the uh, task files um, they're imported directly from github and uh, it will have all the packages installed for you so without further ado i will bring up the presentation and we'll make a start so Fit in distributions with R and really the the why and how of how do we do this distribution fitting in R. So today we'll go through talking about uh, what a distribution is, uh, when you should be using a distribution, when you might use them, uh, how we sample data from a distribution and why we do that. Uh, fitting data to a distribution, that's kind of the key key bit for the workshop today and it's the main um, component that we'll talk about. Um, and also look at a distribution fitting app template um, as a kind of 
a way to help uh, facilitate day-to-day -day, uh, distribution fitting. So in short, really a distribution is all about describing the shape of some data. And what we're trying to do is actually describe the probability of a certain value occurring in the data itself. You know, how, um, what is the likelihood of any particular value within a set spe specified range of values actually occurring in the data? Um, and it really is a, this concise mathematical description of a curve um that describes this spread of the values because it's really important that we understand the variation in our data that it's not just about using average values or medians or modes but actual actually looking at what is the spread of the data how many high values are there how many low values and how that works across the whole range of of our data So what is it that kind of makes up a distribution? Well, it's our raw data, first of all. And here we've got a scatter plot of some raw data. And we can see on the y-axis that we've got, you know, uh, the kind of range of values uh, that our data is taken. And we can get an idea of kind of how many that there's more values here in the uh, lower range than there is in the in the higher range. But it doesn't tell us a huge amount about what the shape of our data is. Histograms are a way that is incredibly useful to start looking at uh, data and trying to understand what the shape, the distribution of our data is. And here we now start to see these greater values in this lower range uh, of the data and that tapers off the higher the values become but again this is a visual description of the data and isn't we can't reuse this so we need to come up with a way of actually uh, mathematically describing the shape of the data. So what we get is something called a probability density function of our data distribution. And this is the empirical density of the, uh, the values and how many, va basically how many values are occurring within a given range. So this is a histogram of the data with a curve plotted over it and our y-axis you can see here is density and this is the probability density so how what is the probability of a value falling between in this instance 0 and 10 and the probability of a value falling between 10 and 20 and this is the starting point for describing a distribution because this is how we can say oh this is what our real our empirical density is following on from that we have something called the cumulative density distribution and this is where it's a, just a different way of looking at the probability density function and it is adding up the probability of every value that we have within our data set and the probability of that value occurring, accounting for all of the values within our data and the likelihood of any of those values occurring. So we can see our last value at the top here, it brings the total probability of uh, cumulative probability to one. So these are kind of the core building blocks of our data distribution. 
and we're going to talk more about these these concepts of uh, PDFs and CDFs, probability density functions and cumulative density functions, as we go through go through the workshop. First of all, though, we're going to talk a little bit about the two main types of distributions. Distributions can be grouped into two key groups, discrete distributions and continuous distributions. Now, when we talk about discrete data, we're talking about data that is uh, in integer data, that is whole numbers, that doesn't have any uh, decimal points at all. And these, uh, so integer data is also just mathematic in mathematical terms described as discrete data. And for distribution fitting, it's important that we differentiate between discrete data distributions and continuous data distributions. And so the key, the, the main types of distribution that you get for discrete data are the uniform distribution. And this is where every value within the distribution within the uh, given range of values has the same probability of occurring. And this is where we can see just this flat line here. Every value, every discrete value has the same probability of occurring. In the Bernoulli distribution, this is one that works that it's just two values within the distribution. So this is where we have discrete data, such as a one and a zero representing yes and no. And so you can use a Bernoulli distribution to describe that. Then we have a geometric distribution. And here we have a very, the, our highest value is also the lowest value in our data. And, oh, sorry, the most common value is also the lowest value in the data range. And we see this ski slope going down to the, uh, the highest value in our given data range. And this geometric distribution is similar to the exponential distribution that you've probably heard of in um, relation to uh, continuous data that we'll look at in a moment. So we get this ski slope shape there. Then we have the binomial distribution, which is more similar to a Gaussian or normal distribution, where we have a, a rise and a fall. Um, and our most common value sits towards the middle of the data range. With the Poisson distribution, what differentiates this from the binomial distribution is that it's more positively skewed towards the lower end of the data range here, and we have a steeper climb to the top. But each of these bars here is giving that indication of the shape of the data and the probability of the different values occurring. With continuous distributions, so continuous data is that which has um, lots of, uh, which has decimal points and can be thought of as not being broken at all. And this is the data we uh, quite commonly work with, and um, these are probably the distributions that you're probably more common, uh, more familiar with. So we get the exponential distribution, which is like the geometric distribution for discrete data, where we have our highest, uh, our most common value being the lowest value. Then we have. Uh, several 
different descriptions of different types of curves. So here we have uh, the gamma distribution, which has a, um, a slow rise, but is positively skewed. And then we have the beta distribution, which is negatively skewed. So we see that our lowest value is the uh, least common value here. The Weeble distribution is um, a, a skewed normal distribution with a, a bit of a bit of a lean in it. Um, chi squared distribution is a, a, a slow uh, a, a sharp uh, a sl sharp rise with a slow descent to it. The normal distribution and the student T are um, what we see as the symmetrical distributions where the average uh, of measures of central tendency are in the middle range of the um, data. And the log normal distribution, which has a steep rise and then falls away and is he heavily positively skewed. So these are the most common types of distribution that you'll find um, kind of that data conform to. There are many other types of distribution, um, some with names. Um, we haven't, we're not gonna look at things like bimodal distributions here today, um, but there is some functionality, limited functionality within R for looking at and fitting these distributions but most commonly what you'll see is somewhere between the discrete distributions if you're working with discrete data commonly um, uniform geometric uh, and Poisson distributions and the binomial um, and within the continuous distributions the exponential distribution log normal and the normal and gamma distributions tend to be very common. But we'll see a little bit about that in a, in a minute. OK, so some generalized uses for distributions. You know, that's great. OK, we've got these names that describe the certain shape of some data. But what what are we using this this for? So a big use is, and one that um, you might have learnt about uh, in, in various maths courses that you've done, will be for uh, inferential statistics. So the idea of hypothesis testing, where we're looking at significant differences between uh, data, is all based on uh, the normal distribution and understanding how data conforms to um, that how the measures of central tendency and the spread of the data differ. And again, determining uncertainty, um, how the, um, the uncertainty around uh, given values, what the spread of that is and what the shape of that uncertainty is. In my work, we use it heavily in predictive modeling. So for parameterizing models. And this is where we're looking particularly at um, modeling the uh, probability of a particular event occurring. And by using probability distributions, we can bring in stochasticity uh, that we're not, um, that we have variability within our model and we can look across a whole range of likely real world values um, and try and approximate what the true what the population data might look like based on our uh, on our, our sample data that we have uh, and that we fit our distribution to. Um, in data engineering, um, missing data uh, 
probability distributions are a way of uh, the, imputing missing data within data set uh, to enable you to fill those gaps um, within your data so you can uh, create a probability distribution based on the data that you do have and then sample uh, values randomly from the probability distribution using the pro likelihood of those values occurring uh, and then actually be able to fill out your data um, so that it is more useful for, uh, for example, hypothesis testing um, or being able to uh, parameterize a model. So real world applications, um, I mean, outside of health service modeling, probability distributions are used all of the time. Uh, for example, manufacturing process control um, is, is a huge uh, area. And many of you will uh, kind of be familiar with uh, statistical process control um, approaches, and they stem from uh, industrial manufacturing originally and are looking at uh, deviation from uh, expected from expected distribution of values and so you can when you uh, see that variation is getting too high that is falling out of your expected uh, distribution or occurring more regularly than the distribution this a specified distribution would allow then you can intervene and bring uh, the process back into line with a, the desired distribution. Um, workflow planning uh, in particular for understanding uh, how common events might be, uh, such as um, in a fast food restaurant, uh, how many uh, orders for particular um, for particular uh, burgers or meals that you might expect within a given time period and how that changes across the day and across the week. And you can create probability distributions to describe that. In robotics, probability distributions are used to uh, for um, actual uh, robotic robot control. Um, because what they're trying to do is to approximate uh, how the robot should be moving um, and how its limbs should move in relation to each other and how much force should be placed and how much it should extend and move about as um, one leg moves, moves and another moves and as the, uh, the actual ground changes um they have to account for an uphill and that uh as the force uh the probability of the ground being on an incline given the force and uh different uh different parameters that the uh the robot is collecting it can calculate its future movements and the probability of what it should be doing a very very complex um use of probability distributions in robotics, but it's one of the key areas for it. Uh, and calculating your insurance. Uh, <laughs> the, the probability of um, us, uh, a 18 year old crashing their car or somebody with a, uh, a red car having an accident, somebody living in a particular area, um, is all described by probability distributions and these are what are responsible for our insurance premiums and how they calculate them. So in health service modeling, uh, which is my, my area of research and uh, more, hopefully more useful to yourselves than um, looking at insurance, uh, I, I use probability distributions when creating different uh, models of health uh, health service pathways and health service operations. So we look at things like 
into arrival times. So this is a time between one patient arriving, for example, at the emergency department, and then the next person arriving. And we can calculate into arrival times based on real data and create a probability distribution of that data and then use that in our model to replicate what is happening in uh, how, how, how many people are arriving at an emergency department or at a, um, a doctor's surgery or walk-in centre. Um, and that tends to be the beginning of a model, kind of people coming into, into your model. Uh, we can also use them for looking at how long an activity will take. So um, we know that perhaps on average, uh, a doctor, an appointment in the GPs might take, uh, that's supposed to be at most 20 minutes. Um, but maybe when we look at the distribution, the majority of um, appointments take 10 minutes, but some only take two minutes. And actually many take, uh, there's, there might be some that take uh, half an hour. So we can start to look at that whole range of um, values that, and how long an activity is taking and uh, calculate that into, uh, and bring that into our model as well. Uh, we can use it for attributing characteristics to individuals, um, male, female, age. So this is where using discrete distributions becomes very useful that we can say, OK, what is the probability of somebody having these particular dem demographic characteristics and build up a, uh, a sample, a, a, a modelled population based on the distribution of characteristics within our uh, within our sample, and then looking at the probability of an event occurring, or uh, the probability of a particular treatment or process outcome. So um, this is where people have uh, perhaps different, you know, uh, diagnoses being given the probability of a particular diagnosis or a particular um, treatment being required. For example, uh, if somebody requires a uh, an X-ray and what the outcome of that X-ray is, whether it's a uh, that they have a fracture or it's not, it's just a bruise or whether it is a break. Um, and we can attribute to our model these probabilities that somebody is going to have these partic particular outcomes and send them through the model in uh, the, a way that is re representative of the real world. So I'm just going to pause there just for a moment and just see if there's any questions that have popped up or anything. Uh, does anybody have any burning questions at the moment? No? If I rattle through this, then uh, we can uh, have a bit of time for discussion at the end, hopefully, and uh, I'll try and try and keep to time for that. Okay. So, before we talk about fitting data to a distribution, to get you used to um, looking at the shapes of some different distributions, uh, it's useful to know how to sample data from a distribution. So when we have a known distribution, which has been derived from the fitting process, that so we've been through it, we might want to sample, well, we will want to sample data from that distribution for use in whatever um, we're doing. So whether for a model or a particular algorithm that we've designed. And this can be used, uh, done using sampling functions for named distributions. Now, 
So for most name distributions, the ones that we've looked at thus far, so for example, the log normal distribution, the exponential distribution, there are built-in functions in R, in R to generate random numbers from these distributions. And there's two main approaches for doing this. So we can either directly sample one or more values from a distribution, or we can generate a set of values from a distribution and then sample from that. So it's so a slight, slight difference, but it depends um, whether you're looking for um, replacement within your uh, data set. Um, if you're looking for uh, with replace to sample with replacement, then directly sampling or generating a set um, with replace data set with replacement is useful. And also if you want to control what the range of values is um, to a certain extent, then using this uh, second approach of generating a set of values from a distribution sampling from those is useful. So, okay, the uh, distribution um, random sampling functions tend to take the form of, they will be the function name, the number of values to be sampled is in, I think, I believe all instances, the first argument. And then there are keyword arguments for the distribution parameters. And it's these distribution parameters that we derive through the fitting process. And that is what we're going to be doing afterwards is getting these values. So um, when we're using, uh, when we want to sample from the uniform distribution, for example, so this is where every, um, every value has the same probability of occurring. We use the function name run if, which is a bit misleading, but actually it's, it's just how it is in R, that one. Um, and in this instance, I've said, I want to sample a hundred uh, values from the uniform distribution. And it requires two keyword arguments. It has a minimum value that, uh, minimum possible value that our values can take and a maximum value as well. There are, uh, as I said, there's other distribution sampling functions that represent uh, kind of pretty much all of the main um, uh, all of the main name distributions, and these again have different parameters that they take because these these are what describe the shape of the distribution. So, what I'd like you to do. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, before that, <laughs> um, if we want to uh, sample from distribution samples using the sample function, um, sample function is simply sample. We pass in the data. This is the vector of uh, values that we've created based on the distribution. The number of values that we want to sample from that distribution and whether we're sampling with replacements and sampling with replacements simply means that uh, it wants a values been chosen out of our uh, data set um, it is either replaced or not back in the data set um, so if replacement is false here the date the uh, once a value is sampled, it can only be sampled once and is not replaced back in the data set. Um, and this is useful, for example, when you're uh, selecting uh, a, a sample of unique individuals, so unique patients, um, and you only want to be able to sample one of them once.
Okay, so just to get a bit used to, to looking at distributions and kind of understanding the shape and how they change when you change some parameters. I'd like you to have a try creating some different distributions using the functions that we've just looked at and change the argument inputs to examine how they change the shape of the data that's coming out. And you can do this by then plotting, do this by plotting uh, the data that's coming out as a histogram using the hist function. And if you want, you can try changing the number of bins in your histogram to get different levels of re resolution on the sample data. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put up uh, the data that I have here. Um, So here, um, if you can see this, there are the functions here, um, the uniform, normal distribution, exponential distribution, the Poisson, and the log normal. Um, and here is how you'd write in the uh, plotting them as a histogram and doing random sampling from those distributions. So have a go um, at bringing these in, trying these different, um, looking at what these the different distributions look at, look like. And just, just take, we'll just take five, well, about seven minutes um, and we'll reconvene at quarter to three. Um, just have seven minutes, just having a bit of a play with those distributions.
just checking, Sean, you, you're not expecting yourself to be off of mute right now because it looks like you might be going through an explanation that you're muted. Just checking. No, sorry, I was just doing a bit of a uh, uh, kind of um, in the background if people uh, <laughs> didn't have an instance of our running that they could see um, some examples of the different got it, got distributions it. and how they change there. No, that's fine. I was just I was cringing as a fellow workshop giver, someone sitting in an explanation for 20 minutes without realising the mute button was on. So I just wanted to check that wasn't what was going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I'm with you. Thank you. OK, but uh, it's a good good time to uh, get going uh, with some. Let's get on with some distribution fitting. So hopefully that just just allowed you if you've not worked a huge amount with distributions that you can have a little see about what we're talking about the spread of data and different shapes of these name distributions that um it can be the differences are, are stark in some instances and more subtle in others um and that by changing these parameters we change the shape of the data that's being produced and so now let's actually have a look and work out how we can uh, get those, extract those parameters from some data. So the basic distribution fitting process, this is, this is how simple it should be. It's, it's not unfortunately, but this is how simple it should be. We have a, you want to look at the shape of your data. You want to fit your data to likely distributions and then check the fit of the data. That's the basic process that we're going going to go through now. So before we go any further, some important warnings and why why this is an, an important process. You might ask, why can't you just use your real data? Um, and why, why bother using a distribution at all? Well, your real data is only a sample of all possible values. There are very, there, there's in many cases, we can't actually sample the an entire population and get all the data for a whole population. So if your data is only a sample, there will be values that fall outside of the range of your known, uh, of your real world values. And the, by using a distribution, we give a bit of flexibility that allows for uh, values outside of those that you've sampled to be, be included. Um, the real use of data in a stochastic, the use of real data in a stochastic model causes something called overfitting. And again, this relates back to your data being only being a sample and that actually we just get a replication of historical what's happened historically which might be okay in some instances but quite often if you're particularly if you're looking at prediction you don't want to just replicate what's happened in the past you want to look at how different variation different changes are actually going to impact on system function or uh, yeah, you know, pro, a, a process that, that you're looking at or a healthcare pathway. Um, and yeah, we, we need that variation contained uh, aside from that contained in the data to better approximate the whole population. And so what do I do when multiple distributions or no distributions might fit your data very well. Uh, distribution fitting is as much an art as it is a science. Um, there's probably statisticians that will um, berate me for saying that, um, but uh, it really is a bit of a, um, a backwards and forwards process that, you know, you have to go over, go through it multiple times, trying different distributions, tweaking the the um, parameters within the distribution, as it relies on a lot on interpretation, experience, uh, and general perseverance with it. And real world data is messy. Um, you know, uh, 
quite often, uh, you know, particularly in healthcare, you know, the data is smaller samples than and under uncontrolled conditions that you're sampling data from. It's just it's it's messy, dirty work. <laughs> um, and you will have to try multiple distributions and tweak them until they until they work. Um, but also, and we will look at, I think, in uh, an, an example of this, that statistically, you're not always going to get a perfect fit with your distribution. With real world, small sample data, you go with what's working well. <laughs> Um, in an instance where you might have a million data points, should you use them all? Definitely not. Definitely not. Using too many data points again causes overfitting. Kind of a rule of thumb is to use between 2,000 and 10,000 data points. Um, where you have greater variation in the data, uh, the more data um, is needed to estimate that variation um, but working with a smaller sample of around two to ten thousand data points is much better than working with a million data points so the distribution fitting process let's let's have a go so um you can if you'd like to, you can follow along or you can uh, listen. And uh, I've got the slides that show the outputs of this code as I go through it. And I've also provided in the task that we'll do after this, um, all of this code that I'm going through now. So uh, you don't have to, don't feel that you have to try and um, copy it down off of the screen. So we're going to make a, a quick plot of the data, first of all. And in this instance, I've uh, just set the seed here. So uh, just, it's always a fun fact uh, <laughs> um, that uh, random numbers are not random numbers. Uh, they are uh, pseudo random numbers in computing. Um, as true random numbers are quite difficult to generate, uh, and we can control the algorithm that creates random numbers. So we can create the same random numbers over and over again. So you can, if you want to, uh, when we come to do the task, you can get exactly the same results as I do by setting your seed to number 12. And uh, that will be in the code. So here we're just going to create some log normal data and 1000 data points with a mean log uh, parameter of 2.7 and a standard de uh, standard deviation log of 0 0.6. And when we plot that, we get this nice scatter graph of our data. And as we discussed earlier, that's it's not particularly helpful um, in describing the shape of our data, but it starts to give us an idea. And this is the type of scatter distribution that you'd expect for a log normal distribution. Um, and each type type of distribution will look subtly different in um, in the scatter graphs. The next stage that we're going to do is create a histogram. Uh, and here I've just given an example using ggplot2 for something a bit different. Uh, but you can just as well use the hist function as we used earlier in the base R package. And when we get plus our histogram of that data, we get this, what well, hopefully by now you're recognizing as a log normal distribution. It looks, it has that, our, it's not that our lowest value is the uh, most common, the modal value. Um, but it's close, it's positively skewed uh, here. So we can start to see that shape occurring. So when you're looking at your data and trying to 
see here we create it we know it's a log normal distribution um but when you're looking at your data and trying to understand what kind of distribution what what shape is it what should i try you can ask yourself some some questions so for example is is the distribution symmetrical and if it is then it's very likely it's a normal or gaussian distribution if it's near near norm uh, near symmetrical is it positively or negatively skewed and this starts you to go oh okay if it's uh, negatively skewed it might well be a, a beta distribution as we saw earlier or it might be that it's a negative exponential distribution um, is there one or more modal values and might be in the most common there are some instances where in data you'll see multiple modes and there are specific distribution fitting techniques for tackling multimodal data um, because you have to account for that uh, multiple peaks in the data. Is the mode the highest or the lowest value? Uh, then it's likely an exponential distribution. If it's near two and negatively skewed, it's quite often that you're looking towards um, uh, a Weeble or Gamma or a log normal distribution. So in this data, we can see that it is one positively skewed, so it tends towards the uh, the origin point of the graph here at zero. And that um, so it's not symmetrical. Uh, our mode is modal value is quite close to the lowest value. Um, so this is saying, yeah, it's going to be something around a log normal uh, Weeble or Gamma distribution. And that's, that's how, as you get more familiar with these, that you can start to go, oh, OK, th those are the ones that I'm going to try fitting first. So to start the distribution to continue the distribution fitting process now uh, process now we can do we can plot our distribution to get our probability density function and our cumulative density function and here the plot dist function from the um, fit dist r plus package takes uh, three arguments, uh, three required arguments. That is your vector of data that um, that you're trying to uh, plot. Uh, it's asking if you want a histogram of the data, um, which I tend to put in true because that's, that's helpful. And do you want the uh, empirical density uh, plotted as well and again it's useful to make that true as well and what we get are these two that I showed you at the beginning our probability density function here on the left and the cumulative distribution on the right and so these are the empirically derived distributions and now when we go in, we fit other distributions to our data, we're going to be looking at the deviation of those theoretical distributions from our um, actual empirical distributions. And this is where if we were to fit, if we were to just take immediately this um, the empirical density um, here 
uh, and use that distribution, those distribution values straight away, we would cause overfitting. And that's, that's what we're trying to, to avoid. So once we've got an idea of uh, what our empirical density function is looking at, looking like with the shape here, and the shape of our cumulative distribution function as well. We then go into, um, we can do something called creating a Cullinan fray graph, fray graph. And this is, I, I, I find this a useful um, way to assess the data, just in terms of looking at the skew of the data and the kurtosis of the data, so the sharpness of the peak of the curve. And here we use uh, the DESC disk um, or desk disk function to create the Cullen and Frey graph. And that takes a vector of data, our data. We then say whether it is a discrete um, distribution or a uh, continuous distribution. Uh, in this instance, we're using uh, continuous data. And then we give a value for bootstrapping. And this is where it's uh, bootstrapping, so it's resampling essentially. Um, and 500 tends to be just a useful value, um, just to give you an idea of um, the kind of bootstrapped, uh, if, if the values change ever so slightly. So we created this data out of a log normal distribution. And what we have here are um, on the y-axis uh, kurtosis and uh, the square of the skew on the x-axis. And these different uh, point markers and lines uh, and the shaded area are showing where theoretical just different theoretical distributions based on our data um, for will likely fall in relation to our data. And so our observation data is this blue dot here. And the blues and the bootstrap values just give an idea of some of the uncertainty around this estimate. <laughs> um, and the log normal distribution that we created this from is actually not the closest line. It's the uh, gamma distribution. It's estimating will likely be more useful um, in estimating our uh, distribution, uh, as will potentially the exponential distribution. And so you start going, oh, hang on, what's what's happening here? This is where distribution fitting is a bit of an art, and it requires us to go through these different stages to try and get different interpretations of the data and the uh, possible fit of distributions. So from the Cullen and Frey graph, we can, and from looking at the shape of the data, we can say, okay, let's try the log normal distribution, the gamma distribution. And I think I've put the uh, exponential distribution in as well. We can try a few different distributions. So, what we can do now is go on and fit these to some possible, um, some uh, candidate distributions. And then we're gonna visually, first of all, visually assess the fit used by looking, comparing our empirical PDF and CDF to the theoretical ones for these distributions. Then we're gonna use QQ and PP plots um, to look at the deviation of these uh, across the range of 
the distributions. Then we're going to go through and calculate goodness of fit and uncertainty parameters, uh, uncertainty estimates around the data uh, and the fit of these distributions. And then we can either uh, select the best fitting distribution and extract the distribution parameters, or we can go back and retest using uh, different distributions. So the fit dist function is what we use for um, fitting, getting the fit of data to named distributions. So this allows us to attain the theoretical fitted curve. And here it takes, uh, again, si simple parameters with this, our um, vector of data. And then in uh, as a string, the uh, named distribution that we'd like to try and fit to the data. Now, there are you can there are about there are four different built-in methods for um estimating the distributions it is something that if you are doing this on a regular basis that it's worth having a little read into and finding out a bit more about the different approaches for estimating uh distribution parameters the default is the maximum likelihood estimate um, method. And I, I put the link to the documentation for this because, yeah, if you do want to get, get into distribution fitting in a, in a bigger way, it's worth having a read um, and having a try of uh, the different uh, fitting approaches. But as a general kind of across the board, and um, particularly for continuous distributions, the maximum likelihood estimate method is quite a good all-rounder, which is why it's the default. So we can get the summary of the uh, fitted distribution by calling summary and uh, the variable that we've um, assigned the fitting parameters to. And the output viewed using the summary function uh, looks like this. We get uh, the fitting and the name of the distribution and by what type of uh, fitting method. And the important numbers here um, are the estimate values as these are the actual um, values that when we did uh, uh, the sampling from a distribution these are the values that were being specified. So this is where we get the link now to say, ah, okay, if we wanted to estimate our data using the Weeble um, uh, distribution, then we'd use the shape and scale estimates here and plug these values in uh, to our uh, distribution. Uh, to create our distribution data and to sample from it. So those, I'm not going to go in too much into what uh, the rest of these all mean as uh, the Weeble function uh, isn't a particularly useful one here. Um, but we will look at some of these numbers in a minute. So yeah, it's just understanding that eventually we want to we want to find out what are the best estimates for the distribution parameters. So to expedite this pro uh, fitting process, it's you can just fit more than one distribution at a time. Sorry, fit more more than one distribution at a time using uh, lists and loops. Um, and the uh, disfit R package works perfectly well with this uh, kind of approach. Um, so here we're going to fit the gamma, log normal, and uh, Weeble distributions. And here we get our multiple summaries being printed out.
So, okay, that's great. We've got the fits and we've got estimated parameters for different the fits of different distributions. But we need to go through and try and work out which one is the most useful. So, though, as I said, we're going to compare the probability density functions, the cumulative density functions, the and then the deviation um, of the uh, of these values um, of the quartiles and of the um, uh, of the cumulative distribution from uh, our observed values. Uh, just a little note that, um, so, well, two notes here. Uh, first of all, uh, we're plotting a legend with uh, these, which is, is really useful, and that takes our dis um, distribution names from the previous function, this, this one here. So it just takes a list of uh, strings, string values of the functions that we uh, sorry, the distributions that we're using. Uh, and also that here, setting the plot parameters uh, to create a two by two uh, grid of these four plots that we're gonna create. This is can be omitted uh, and, and just depends um, whether you want the plots individually or altogether. So here is an example of the um, the theoretical densities plotted again on top of the real data here. And what you see is that actually at first glance you go, oh, wow, the uh, gamma distribution seems to very well estimate the uh, our maximum uh, modal value here. Um, and it seems pretty, pretty, a pretty decent curve. Um, <clears throat> however, what it doesn't do is come all the way down, um, and we'll see why that's important uh, in a minute. And you go, oh, well, we get a bit of overestimation here on the log normal um, distribution, that the peak is a bit high. And with the Weeble, it's a bit low, really. Um, is that going to, is, is that the best estimate? Okay, that's, so, so there's pro, pros and cons with uh, these, each of these, well, apart from the Weeble, really, the, it's kind of between the gamma and the log normal distribution at the moment, looking at these curves. And then we look at the uh, CDF uh, plot now. The black is the observations, the observed cumulative density function. And then it's a little bit difficult to make out on here, but we have the green, red and blue um, curves here. And with the Weeble not fitting particularly well, um, but there's not a huge amount. Uh, there's a bit between the gamma, which actually is a bit low here on estimating the cumulative density function, and a bit high here. And actually, log normal fits much more nicely along the line of the cumulative density function. So there's these small differences here that we can visually assess and that are actually really important for understanding where we've got a decent enough fit to our data. So here, looking at the QQ plot, and this is where we can see these differences exacerbated much more, um, that it becomes much more obvious that the log normal is a much more, a much better fit to this uh, line here, which represents uh, the empirical quantiles. So it becomes, uh, you know, it, it kind of quite starkly shows, oh, actually, there's um, large amounts of underestimation from the log normal and the gamma, uh, sorry, from the gamma and the Weeble distributions. 
And when we look here at the PP plot, we see this again, that uh, in terms of um, estimating deviation from the CDF, that the green the log normal sits much more nicely on the line and both the gamma and the Weibull distributions deviate quite significantly off of the uh, off of that line of the empirical uh, probabilities. So we say we're seeing there that actually, although um, it might have looked initially like uh, the gamma distribution, particularly from the Cullen and Frey graph, which was quite misleading, um, that the gamma distribution might have been a, a better fit, but actually that's that's not the case at all. Uh, it's definitely that log normal seems to be the better fit. Now, moving from visual assessment, we go to uh, looking at statistical assessment and do goodness of fit. So goodness of fit is done using the GOF uh, stat uh, function. And this takes the fit data and it's quite happy to take, it can either take um, individual, uh, just a single fitting instance, uh, if you're just fitting one dis distribution, but it will also quite happily take uh, the a list of uh, different distributions being fitted. So we can just pass our list of uh, fitted distribution parameters in here and pass in a list of names of the distributions that we have fitted. And what we get is three different uh, sets of goodness of fit statistics. And what we're trying to do in each of these instances is to minimize the statistic without going into lots of horrible stats. Um, the simplest way is to say we're looking for the one that minimizes each of the Kamolograph, Smirnov, uh, Smirnov Kramer von Mises and Anderson Darling statistics which are all just measures of um, these deviations uh, between the empirical and the theoretical uh, probability density functions and cumulative density functions. Um, the uh, goodness of fit criteria, um, these information criterion uh, are not for, for practical distribution fitting, they're not um, enormously helpful, but what they do give an indication of is uh, whether these are distributions, wh whether it's a fittable distribution. Um, and we can see that these kind of range of values around 7,000 um, providing acceptable um partly acceptable um distribution values but if we actually so that's the sorry that's the summary if we just view f here the uh, goodness of fit statistics um sorry um when we actually look more deeply, this is just a screenshot of uh, all of the uh, goodness of fit statistic information. And here we see um, for the different tests um, that they've got the initials, uh, the Anderson Darling, uh, the Smirnoff one, <laughs> um, that actually, uh, statistically is saying that these should be rejected or are not computed. Um, and it is only on the KS test, the, uh, the Komolograv Smirnoff statistic that uh, is not rejected here. Um, 
so we actually get this uh, visual, um, the, uh, an actual assessment of what uh, distribution fits best. And quite often um, you will get all of them rejected, but that's just due to the messiness of the data. But in this instance, it's saying that definitely both visually we've identified that the log normal distribution fits best and statistically it fits best as well, uh, given the uh, Kamolorov Smolov test. But yeah, um, don't be alarmed if you do get all rejected, but you're going, the fit's probably good enough. Um, particularly with small amounts of data or messy data, you will get that quite often. Um, we can also uh, estimate the uncertainty around these parameter estimates that we're getting. So the parameter estimates that we got in the fit um, from the original fitting, we can produce, undertake a bootstrapping simulation to estimate the confidence intervals for these. Uh, and sorry, uh, so this is being done in a loop for uh, all of the um, distributions that we fitted. And it's the boot dist function that we're using here and passing in, uh, going iterating over the, the fit, uh, the fitting list uh, and number of iterations, uh, bootstrapping iterations that we're going to run here. And then we're printing the uh, the summary estimates out here. So uh, here's the outputs and what we get is the uh, median um, parameter estimates and we get the uh, 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 2.5% um, range uh sorry <laughs> and we get get the um uh all but the last uh kind of the uh, uh the upper and lower bounds that's what i'm after those are the words that i'm after uh, the upper and lower bounds of uh the parameter estimates so, and this gives you a little bit of wiggle room in which to so we're going to select for example we know this is log normal data and uh our original uh, parameters that went into this were 2.7 and for the mean log and 0.6 for the uh, standard, devi uh, standard deviation log. And so we can actually, we can see that the uh, mean log value ta takes that in uh, and kind of is, is up towards the top end of uh, the parameters here. But this is where this little bit of wiggle room uh, can be useful if uh, you use your estimated distribution in a model and it's not quite providing the numbers that you expect during your uh, validation process. And so you can use the upper and lower bounds within as a range in which to test little tweaks to the um, to your uh, parameter estimates for your distribution. So yes, so um, here are uh, originally fitted um, parameter estimates, uh, 2.68 and 0.57. And then we've got our upper and upper and lower bounds that we can work within. And that is that's that's the the whole process that you kind of need to be going through um, each time that you're fitting distributions. Um, so I, I have waffled on a little bit long. Hopefully everybody's got a few minutes um, to have a go uh, at doing a bit of distribution fitting. There are um, some data sets and the task code. Um, and actually, if I mention quickly now, and then everybody can have a bit of a play and I will, I will hang, hang around as long as people want to um, 
have a, a, a little go with the code and do a bit of distribution fitting. Um, there's another package called, just to mention quickly, there's another package called Actuar, which uh, contains more named distributions that could be used um, in combination with the FitDist R plus package, which is the one that we're using here today. Um, and so once you do start using them, you'll find they are really useful. Um, it's not an art exact science, it is a bit of an art. Um, and you need to be doing this, these kind of things repetitively. Um, and we can build custom apps to, uh, as a way of being able to do this. And you'll find within the uh, RStudio Cloud folder and in the GitHub repository, there's a folder called App Template Files, and that contains a Shiny app which contains the code that um, you've got in the task and basically organizes it as an app. There are some improvements that can be made to it, so it's it's a, a template and not a finished app either, um, but might be a good one uh, if you are finding yourself doing a lot of distribution fitting uh, as a way to get started doing that. Uh, just some a couple of resources in the slides there. Um, and I will go back to the distribution fitting exercise. If anybody does have some time to have a go, um, I, I will stay around um, for, for another uh, 10, 15 minutes. And if anybody has any questions, uh, I can answer them as well. Sorry, I've run a little bit over on uh, uh, explaining all that for you. <laughs> No, it was brilliant, Sean. Thank you very much. And uh, not to press you around with such uh, long surnames of all the statisticians. So it <laughs> yeah. might took half of time to just pronounce Kulmagor of Smirnov. Uh, but anyway, thanks very much for attending. And uh, I hope people can uh, stay uh, online and do some of the uh, analysis uh, themselves. But if not, uh, I'm just sharing the link now uh, for the um, feedback form. So please, please uh, fill the feedback uh, for this workshop. Um, all you need to do is just it's going to take three minutes of your time. Uh, just choose this workshop as if it's distributions in the first question and uh, rate it. It will really help us uh, as a, well, I'm, I'm saying us, but it will really help NHS our team uh, just, you know, show the results of the conference, uh, make some conclusions and also uh, report to the funder as well. So please uh, spare us a minute if you have time. Uh, but yeah, um, I think I will um, ask to stop recording soon as well. So if people want to jump on the call and ask questions out loud, uh, no one uh, has any you know, hesitation.